So we're in this series on Joseph. And I want to be sure that each week of this journey, this is week four, and I, I want to be very diligent to always start with actually this verse from the New Testament. Philippians 1.6. Because you see, it is a parallel and a testimony of Joseph's life, but it is also absolutely brings in that story from those thousands of years ago into this room, into this night, as we see ourselves through his uh, uh, walk and his challenges. It was and it always is the fact that God begins the work in you and I, and God continues his work until it is finally finished by his design, until it's finally finished in, in, in his plan for our lives. Now what that means, of course, is if he's continuing the work, that each moment and each, each uh, encounter in our lives, we have to recognize it's not random. God does not do random. Everything is part of his plan. Studying a book like Joseph where we know the ending, it's, it's maybe a little easy to disconnect and go, you know, this guy ended up on top of the world, but we don't see any of that in the middle of our trial. Well, neither did he. Last week as we walked through the uh, last installment, we, uh, we were in Genesis 39. Joseph had been taken down and sold into slavery, but Scripture is very clear in that second verse that the Lord was with Joseph. Even though he was a slave, he became successful and prosperous. And I called last week's message, the waiting is the hardest part, because he experienced it. We often experience it. Even though we're sure by God's word that the Lord is with us, it seems like it takes so long for things to come together. It seems like it takes so long for that breakthrough. And I'm with you. It can be frustrating, exasperating, taxing on our faith. And yet as we looked at Joseph last week, we realized that the Lord was with him, but Joseph did his part. During his delay, he worked hard. He did not slack. He did not complain. He was not a whiner. No whining, dude. No whining. <laughs> he remained faithful. He resisted temptation. And he constantly brought glory to God. You know what that comes down to? That comes down to having the right attitude. I just want to encourage you. The message is posted on YouTube, the Haven Church NJ. Stay at, in pace with us. Let the Lord talk to you through it. I, I'll be honest, some of these, I believe that maybe if they don't apply to you at this moment, this is kind of a, a, something you can keep in the bank. You could draw it out when you need that resource. So tonight, let's, let's keep moving in this in this fantastic story amazing story where we left our hero last week in the end of the study in Genesis 39 19 and 20 it says that Potiphar was furious when he heard that his wife's story about Joseph how he had treated her now we know it was a false accusation she claimed sexual assault and there was none of that that went on she just set him up because she had been spurned and Potiphar had to, of course, side with his wife over this slave as much as he loved and trusted him. And so Joseph was thrown into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. So tonight, if you'll allow me for the next few moments, let's do part four. And I want to call it In Prison with a Promise. Now, we're not physically caged in tonight. Matter of fact, I love the fact that in this Fifth week in this new facility here. I love the fact that we have some room to spread out. It's nice, isn't it? Anybody that was with us in Burrs Road, it got a little tight, it got a little scary. It's nice to have some breathing room. But in life situations, there can be occasions where our, 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 our life pattern takes us to a place where we almost feel like we're in prison. Maybe it's a job we're just fed up with. It's a dead-end job. Maybe it's trying to hang on while uh, we, we know God has more for us, and, and yet nothing seems to be breaking through. It can feel like a place of prison. And sometimes, in those places, we can get restless. Sometimes in those places where we feel like God is not coming through soon enough, we not only get restless, but sometimes we get discontented. Lord, you, you, surely you've forgotten about me. Surely the promise you gave, uh, the purpose I feel for my life, surely I must have missed something. I, I just speak for myself, having lived through some of those in my life's journey, and probably will have some more. In those moments, there can be an urge to make big changes with or without God's blessing. 
restlessness, a desire to be free from where God brought us before it's time can at times push us into making rash decisions. Several years ago, I was leading worship in a church on a Sunday morning. And it was a traditional looking church and I was a staff member there and it was the early service and people were coming but no one was singing. Nobody wants to sing at 8.30 in the morning, yo. And I'm up there but it wasn't that that was eating away at my soul. It was that I felt I had been trapped in a situation in that church. There was drama going on behind the scenes. There was abuse going on behind the scenes. There was things that were absolutely rotten going on. And yet I was there by God's plan and God's design. And I kept saying, God, would you release me from this? And he kept me in that prison. And this one Sunday morning, I remember it so clearly. I'm, I'm leading the worship and I'm doing what I do because it's for him that I do it. But in my mind, I was screaming. You know what I was screaming? Run. I envisioned myself in the middle of worship songs, how great is our God. I envisioned myself stopping playing, jumping off this platform, and running like Forrest Gump. I was so pent up inside. Thank God I didn't. Things did end up working to where he opened the door and it was better than I could have ever designed or planned. So I encourage you with that. But I know what it's like and so did Joseph to feel like there's so much more and God has given you so much more and promised you so much more and nothing seems to be happening. Now, over in Psalm 105, it's basically a, a history lesson of a part of Israel's history. And there's a couple of verses dedicated to Joseph. And verse uh, 19 of Psalm 105 says this. Until the time that Joseph's dreams or prophecy regarding his future came to pass, the word of the Lord tested and refined him. Now think about that a minute. I thought the word of the Lord sets us free. I thought the word of the Lord brings us peace and comfort. There are times, according to Scripture, that the word of the Lord will test and refine. Now listen, testing and refining to me speaks of pain. The pain of being molded. The pain of being shaped. The pain of having the rough edges smoothed off. What it talks about is, in the walk of faith... That same word that brings victory can also bring conviction, and it can also at times keep us in a place while the process continues. I want you to understand something. God orders both our steps and our stops. Somebody may want to tweet that tonight. The same God that orders every step we take, and we know he does, sometimes he also orders the stops. Now, you and I can choose to not cooperate. But I have found that is a dangerous and costly place to be and not a way to live. In prison with a promise, sometimes waiting for your breakthrough can feel so confining. In a place in life you just, you just don't want to be anymore. So it was. With Joseph. Now, let me give you some historic context before we move into tonight's study because I think it'll help you grasp a little of the magnitude of where this young man was. So think back to the year 2007, back in the day for some of you. 11 years ago, think about where you were in 2007. How old were you? Where did you live? What job did you have? In the year 2007, I had my own business in the transportation industry, and business was amazing. The house I live in right now in 2007 was worth twice of what it's worth right now. Things have gotten crazy. A lot has happened since 2007. A lot. Let me give you some cultural context. In 2007, that was the hottest cell phone right there. That's the LG Shine. I know. You can find that today in the Smithsonian Institute next to the dinosaurs and my yearbook picture. I'm just saying. Later in 2007, however, this moment happened. The iPhone was introduced 11 years ago. Look how small that first phone looked. Steve Jobs changed the world with the iPhone in 2007. Seems like we've had it forever. It's only been the last 11 years. 
In 2007, Netflix began streaming movies. Prior to that, you had to get the little thing in the mail. You remember that? Little DVD sleeve? Man, we sound old when we remember that. And in 2007, some of you are going to gasp at this. There was no Instagram. It did not exist. So, think about all that's happened in your life, in society, in culture. Just think about it for a moment. All that's happened in the last 11 years. A lot gets jammed into a time like that. Now, here's the deal. That's how long Joseph has been in prison and as a slave where we pick up the account tonight. It's been 11 years since his brothers took him, threw him in that pit, took off the coat, claimed to his father that he was killed, sold him as a slave. He goes to work for Potiphar. He gets falsely accused. And now it keeps getting worse. Where we're picking up tonight's account is 11 years. Think of how much time he has had to deal with his lot in life. 11 years. Now, we're going to cover a lot of ground tonight, so I want to break it up into four pieces. You ready? A cup, a cake, some cows, and new clothes. You guys ready? Here we go. Let's start. Genesis 39, 21 and 22. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite of the prison warden. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. Joseph is in that place. He doesn't deserve to be there. And yet the Lord's still with him. And yet even though time is passing, he continues to work hard and God continues to give him favor. We switch over to chapter 40. The first four verses says this. Sometime later, Pharaoh's chief uh, chief cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. Pharaoh became angry with those two officials and he put them in the prison where Joseph was. They remained in the prison for quite some time. And the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph who looked over them. Now listen. There's historians that believe that what happened is the cupbearer, who, by the way, had this amazing job. His job was to taste everything, uh, uh, every kind of liquid beverage, usually wine or maybe Starbucks coffee, one or the other. He had to test it first to be sure it was not poison. So can you imagine, over time, the trust that must have developed between this cupbearer? Pharaoh trusted him every time he took that cup and drank it because this man put his life on the line. That was his job. The baker, of course, was the last one in that kitchen that made sure the meals or the pastries were done just right. So what historians feel happened is somebody put it in Pharaoh's ear that these two guys were actually conspiring as part of a coup to poison Pharaoh and bring down his government. So while Pharaoh is trying to figure out what's going on, he throws him in prison. And oh, by the way, it's the prison where Joseph is now uh, doing a lot of responsibility. Not random at all. The reason they got there really is not as important as the fact that they're there because Joseph is there. Now, being in a place where you don't want to be, listen to me. Being in a place you don't want to be or don't believe you deserve to be in life. Having the right attitude, doing everything right, doesn't necessarily mean that the bars all of a sudden open and we walk free. The process continues until God says the character is molded to a point where I can now move you into something else. And what I love is these guys being thrown in prison with Joseph actually represented opportunity. And we're going to look at that tonight. I can tell you that even in your most confining and frustrating place in life, God will bring you opportunities to bring him glory and serve him. I've lived that. Several years ago, I had to have some surgery. And it wasn't a big deal, you know, same day, in and out, but they had to put me under. And when they did, they had to intubate me. And when they did, I think rather than, uh, you know, what, what kind of technician does intubation? What's he called? Anesthesiologist? Thank you. I had some kind of a car mechanic, I think. <laughs> because by the end of the night of the surgery, my throat was all damaged. My uvula swelled up so much I was gagging. I couldn't breathe. And I'm, I'm thinking I'm dying. 
I have this surgery that should, should be no big deal, and I am in absolute agony. And I'm just going to confess, just because it's just her, us here tonight, but I did some whining. I did a little bit of complaining to the Lord. I said, Lord, here I am. I'm in pain. I can hardly breathe. I'm in agony. I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be ministering. I can't even get out. I was working at a church and doing all kinds of things. I, I couldn't even do any of that. I'm stuck in that bed, and I feel miserable. I felt like the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. Now, I never heard an audible voice, but I felt he spoke to my heart, and he said this simple phrase. I heard it in my heart. He said, what's in your hand right now? Well, I happen to have had an iPhone, thanks to Steve Jobs in 2007. I had an iPhone in my hand. I was looking at news or reading sports or watching Netflix or something like that, and the Lord said, how about you use that and let that be your voice today? Couldn't talk felt miserable, but I took out that phone and I started texting encouraging messages to people in the church where I served. And I started texting scriptures and I started texting prayers and I felt like the more I did, the more my spirit was lifted up. And even though it took several days for the agony of that moment to go past and the physical trial to be over, in that moment I felt my spirit bowing. What's my point? Even in prison, even in confinement, even in a job you hate, God will give you opportunity if you listen and look for it. And if you take advantage of those opportunities to be a, a life, a light, an encouragement to somebody else, God is going to bless your spirit. You'll be stronger for it, and you'll come out with an additional testimony. Here's the way Scripture tells us in Galatians. I love this. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not get tired of doing what is good. When everything's great, the bills are paid, you're not frustrated at work. Everything's wonderful. That's when you're not supposed to get tired. No. It's across the board. No matter what scenario we're in, never get tired of doing what is good. The opportunities are coming. God says in his word, at the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. So here's Joseph. And here's these two scoundrels coming right from the palace into this jail and Joseph has to take care of them. The scripture tells us in Genesis 40 verse 5 that while they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a dream one night and each dream had its own meaning. So Joseph comes in, Scripture tells us, one morning, and he's, I don't know, serving them their breakfast or whatever his job was, but he noticed they looked downcast. He noticed they looked a little depressed. He noticed they were wearing their hearts on their sleeve, and Joseph says, dudes, what's up? And they begin to tell him that they had these dreams. Verses 9 and 11, the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream, and he says, in my dream, I saw a grapevine in front of me, and the vine had three branches that began to bud and blossom. And soon it produced clusters of ripe grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, so I took the cluster of grapes, squeezed the juice into the cup, then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Now here's the story. The guy has this dream that the cup was a part of his life. The cup was the reason he's now in jail because supposedly he was conspiring to do something. But God brought the cup back to the surface in this dream. And Joseph listens, and God lets him interpret it. And he says this, in three days you'll be back handing Pharaoh his cup of wine. Gives him a, such an encouraging word. And then before he leaves, in verse 14, with this encounter, Joseph says, please remember me and do me a favor when things go well with you. I love that. Not if. He says, when things go well with you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this place. Can I just talk to somebody tonight? You feel in prison. You're feeling really cramped up. You're feeling so frustrated day by day. If you allow yourself to remain faithful and true, I can say tonight, when things go well with you, not if, when, a breakthrough will come. When it does, remember the source of it all. Give God glory. Give him more of your life. Dive in deeper. Allow that process that you're in right now to produce more than you can imagine, both for here and for eternity, when it goes well. I also love that in this account that this, this verse, this end of the conversation speaks of such hope that Joseph had. So naturally, the baker is sitting there. 
he hears this wonderful dream interpretation. And he's got a pretty funky dream. So he says next in the, uh, verses 16 and 17, uh, he hears about it. He says, well, let me tell you about my dream since you gave such a positive interpretation. He said, in my dream, there were three baskets of white pastries stacked on my head. The top basket contained all kinds of cake for Pharaoh, but the birds came and ate them from the basket on my head. Now we got this cake. The man who's the baker has a dream, and God brings into this dream the cake, and God gives Joseph the interpretation. Here's what he tells him. Dude, in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you, and you are going to be hanged. What? Not a good word, but you know what I love about what Joseph did? He obeyed God even when the word was kind of difficult. You know, sometimes I deal with that as a, as a preacher. Sometimes God lays some things on my heart. You know, I've described it to you before as sometimes I serve steak and bacon and sometimes I serve ice cream and sometimes I have to serve peas and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Sometimes it's not so pleasant but it is required as the complete diet and complete obedience to God I appreciate that Joseph he could have easily just told him anything the dude would never know but he's true to what God told him God was keeping note of all of this and so the account goes on to say Pharaoh's birthday came three days later and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and his staff, and he summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials. These guys think, let the good times roll. This is great. We're back in good graces. Then he restored the chief cupbearer to his former position so he could again hand Pharaoh his cup, but Pharaoh hung the chief baker just as Joseph had predicted when he interpreted the dream. Now, what was the last thing that Joseph said to the dude when everything goes well? He said, remember me. But scripture tells us next in verse 23 that the cupbearer forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. Now, you know word got back to Joseph. The cupbearer has been restored, and Joseph had to have in his heart hope He's going to remember, I'm the one that prophesied this. It's only been three days. Surely he's not going to forget. And then time goes by and nobody comes to rescue Joseph and no official comes to set him free. And you have to realize this was another incredible setback to someone who was living right and being faithful to God. Another setback. And meanwhile, time continues to move on and he's still in prison with this promise when God called me to preach I was 35 years old wasn't looking for it didn't want it kind of caught a glimpse almost a little bit like a vision of speaking whatever I was a musician I had no desire to do that I I'd come out of the the, the the secular world of music I was now leading worship and that was my place of comfort I'll share it perhaps in detail another time but I'm 35 God shows me this vision and I begin to go wow this is really awesome after all I did God brings me back to his his family he saves my soul he gives me another chance and there's this great opportunity coming but the first time I got a chance to actually preach was 10 years later. Nothing seemed to have happened for a decade. But oh, God was preparing me. And God is preparing some of you. Hold on. Don't rattle the bars. Stay in God's presence. Allow Him to bring you comfort and peace. And oh, by the way, it wasn't until 12 years after that time of preaching that God finally allowed me to have a church like this. Time can seem to move so slow when the frustrations build. And so it did for Joseph. We turn the page into Genesis chapter 41 and verse 1 says this. After this, two whole years passed. We got any math majors in the room? What's 11 plus 2? Thirteen. It's not a trick question. It's 13. 
My hockey players on the front row knew this. They have not been checked into the boards too many times. They still got their wits. They're still brilliant. 13 is correct. Joseph has been in this life of backward, downward spiral, slavery, betrayal for 13 years. Pharaoh has this dream. And in the dream, he's standing by the Nile River. And he sees seven fat cows come up out of the river. And they begin grazing. And then he saw seven more cows come up behind him. But these were scrawny and thin. And these cows stood beside the fat cows on the riverbank. The scrawny cows ate the seven healthy cows. At this point in the dream, Pharaoh wakes up. Now somehow, God in his plan decides he's going to use cows. Now, if you've been with the Haven for any length of time, you know we like cows around here. I, I like to put them in my message whenever possible. But what it means in this particular point is God was warning Pharaoh of impending hardship. Here's what else it means. God was beginning to stir for Joseph's breakthrough. And he didn't know it. At this point, Joseph doesn't even know about the dream. But Pharaoh has another dream. And it disturbs him again, and he seeks some interpretation from his wizards and from his sorcerers and those that are supposed to have mystical abilities, and none of them can interpret it. And now the cupbearer, Scripture says, finally remembers Joseph. Can't you see it? He goes, dude, I forgot about Joseph. I don't know why my cupbearer sounded like a surfer from California. I'm not, not sure. I'll blame that on the medication. He finally remembers. And so look what happens next. Pharaoh sent for Joseph at once, and he was quickly brought from the prison. Don't you find it a little odd that God put the word quickly when he'd been in this situation for 13 years? But here's what he means. When the time is right, when the fullness of God's time is right, it will break free quickly. You'll be in prison one moment, and you'll be out the next moment. So it was, because here's what he says. Bring him up, shave him, put on some new clothes. Oh, yeah, it's time for those, those garments that he'd been wearing. It's time for that prison garb, the orange, whatever it was he had on. I don't know. It's time to change the outward, because something major is about to happen. In verses 17 and 25 of Genesis 41, Pharaoh tells Joseph his dreams. And Joseph responds, listen, both these dreams have the same meaning. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he's about to do. Joseph begins to interpret. He said seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of grievous famine. But if you prepare properly, we have time to avert it. And Joseph's standing there and he's saying, you got to find the right guy with the right capability. you got to find the right person. Now remember, Joseph is a Hebrew. Joseph's not an Egyptian. He's a foreigner. And yet he's standing there in the power of God and God is about to break free in his life. All that kept him bound. Pharaoh hears the advice, and Pharaoh responds, and he says, guess what? It rings true what you said, and I think, Joseph, you're the man. And Scripture says Pharaoh removed the signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger, significant symbol of authority. And he dressed him in fine linen clothes and hung a gold chain around his neck, a little bling to go with this dude's new outfit. And then he had Joseph ride in a chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. Oh, yeah, we got to go back to those new clothes that are mentioned here. It is significant because, you see, there was a time in his life Joseph dressed completely differently. But now he was dressing for a new season. Follow me on this. God was about to do something on the outside that represented what was about to happen on the inside and for the rest of his life, changing his destiny. No longer the rags of a slave or the prideful coat of youth. Now robes of responsibility and purpose to be a blessing to many. Listen, I believe, I believe I can say with the authority of God's scripture and the anointing of the Holy Spirit tonight, some of you feeling all trapped and bound up in a place in life you don't want to be, feeling like God has forgot about you. Maybe if you'll change your clothes. What do I mean? 
Maybe if in spread of all that heaviness you're wearing, maybe if you start wearing some praise garments. Maybe if you start praising him in the midst of where you're at. Maybe if you change your, your outward demeanor. Maybe if you change the outward appearance as it reflects to others that although you're frustrated on the inside, you allow your life to reflect his goodness. I love the prophecy in Isaiah 61 speaking of Jesus and his ministry. And some of the things it says is Jesus is going to give the oil of gladness instead of mourning and the garment of praise instead of a spirit of heaviness. Can I challenge somebody tonight? Put on that garment of praise in your prison. Refuse to allow it to steal your song. Your place is really a place of preparation. And I believe with all my heart, if we praise him in times of preparation, that God can help strengthen us and perhaps facilitate that breakthrough even sooner. Would you close your eyes for a moment tonight? I just want to talk to you for a second. And then I'll let you go. Now, as I prepared this message, I'll let you glance into my study for a moment. And I'm in there and I'm saying, God, maybe we should just get to the end of the story where everything goes great. Maybe I should just do a little brief summary and then move on into where everything is wonderful. I felt the Lord say, somebody is in prison and they're about to make a rash decision based on restlessness tell them be still and know that I'm working in their life be still and while you're waiting for your deliverance hear me in the spirit allow praise to return to your heart allow praise to return to your soul allow praise and a song to once again be on your lips even in that place, I felt like God said it's too important. Somebody needs to take a deep breath and fill their lungs with praise. Now, I love you guys. And I trust the Lord tonight. And I want to give maybe just a little additional opportunity for somebody to feel the peace and presence of God. Maybe even have a breakthrough in this very room. I'm going to ask some of our leaders that I've talked to to come on up front, stand in front of this stage tonight. And just what they're going to do is they're just going to make themselves available. If you would like someone to spend just a moment and pray with you tonight, whatever, it's, it's confidential. Maybe you, just, maybe you just didn't even know what you need. You just need somebody to lay their hands on you and, and pray for you because they love you. This is your opportunity. They're just going to lift up your name. And they're just going to lay hands and they're just, going to, they're just going to respond in faith. You guys spread out right along the front here. Spread out. Now, if you're in this place and you would like someone to pray with you tonight, you need a breakthrough. And until then, you need peace. Come on up. They're going to pray with you while Amanda sings. We're just going to take a few moments. I'm going to ask the rest of you, just relax. Just allow the Holy Spirit to bring you peace and calm. But if you need someone to pray for you, that's why they're here tonight. Come on, take advantage. Thank you for these moments in your presence. Thank you for the eternal power of your word. Thank you for people that have expressed their need and responded in faith to the Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, I pray each and every one, especially that one feeling so bound up, would leave a little freer tonight. Lord, keep talking to us. Lord, keep revealing yourself to us. God, keep us calm. Keep us patient. That one that's uh, just so tempted to run and be restless. Lord, would you just sweep over them with peace tonight and allow us to continue to grow and be more like you. Bless our time of fellowship, I pray, oh God. Watch over every home and every family in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I love you guys. Let's enjoy some fellowship together tonight.